bombs started hitting and we all had to move. So it was, it was unfortunate um, that, you know, I, I feel like we could have had an incredible city um, uh, uh, where people, we were forming these alliances, but that's when everyone suddenly got the eviction notices and Boston has become extremely gentrified since. So, um, so that's mostly what I write about and I mostly write about, um, basically I try to uh, keep it, you know, grassroots and with an emphasis on survivors and, and the people who have been most impacted by, like a lot of the stuff that's been written about. Instagram for moderator, when you talk to can't hear you. All right, uh, when, um, in so most of the stories about South Boston in recent years have um, been um, mostly about gangsters and not about the people impacted by all of that stuff. So not about basically very vulnerable population of women and children and in extreme poverty. And so I've always been up against the grain with that because the whole, all the Hollywood depictions since the neighborhood did start coming out and start since it became known for what was really going on there, um, it's been, it's, the focus has been on um, the kind of juicy gangster stuff rather than these extremely vulnerable poor people who were wiped out. Right. Michael, that's a really powerful story. Um, Manuel, can you tell us a little bit more about your work? Certainly. I'll, uh, that seems loud enough, right? Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself and my history and how that ties into what I write, um, what I do with uh, my creative uh, urges. Uh, I was born in uh, the small town of Florence, Colorado, which is uh, down south by the Arkansas River. At the time when, uh, when I lived there, it was a small rural town of about 3,000 people. Uh, today, it's mostly known because it's the home of Supermax, uh, the most famous prison in the world, probably. Mm -hmm. And the prison industry has taken over that town, and uh, it's, it's now much larger than the 3,000 people that uh, I remember. But I grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the town where we had Italian-Americans, Eastern Europeans, and Mexican-Americans. Um, most of the men worked either in the mines or construction or the steel mill in Pueblo. Most of the women stayed home and raised children uh, or were waitresses. The, um, the, we all knew our place where we were supposed to live and, and uh, enjoy and uh, relax. But it was also a place where, because it was so small, we all knew each other, we all knew our histories. And I actually uh, find a lot of inspiration for the stories I tell today from uh, having lived in Florence uh, as a child. Now, my family is Chicano, Mexican-American. My father was born in Mexico, but came across the border when he was probably four or five. My mother was born in a town of Chandler, which was a suburb of Florence, if you can believe that. Um, Chandler was a mining town. It was owned by the mining company. And uh, it was a coal mine, and that's where my uncles and my grandfathers uh, worked. And when the mine closed, the town closed, and everybody dispersed. And so my mother and her family moved to Florence, eventually hooked up with my father. Uh, in, that, in that town of Florence was a small library. Um, it could easily fit in this hall. But it was where I spent a lot of my time as a kid. I like to say that I might have been the first Chicano nerd that uh, was raised in the United States. I, I, I read um, all kinds of stuff in the library, but I was especially attracted to crime literature. And I read um, Hammett and uh, Cain, especially James M. Cain, uh, noir fiction, hard-boiled fiction. And uh, even at that young age, when I was in there, I was attracted to that kind of story. So the librarian came to know me, and she let me read really whatever I wanted to read. Eventually, uh, my father's work in construction took us to Colorado Springs, where I finished high school. I went to Colorado State University. This was in the late 60s, early 70s. I became involved in what was known as the Chicano Movement at the time. The, um, the issues that we fought on campus um, as organized students were issues that you still hear about today. Um, we needed more minority student enrollment. We needed more people of color in the faculty. We needed more relevant courses. We needed tutoring and scholarship help for the students that didn't want to come. We needed actual recruitment of the students. 
So we were involved, uh, the group that we helped organize was called the Mexican American Committee for Equality, or MACE, and we united with the Black Student Alliance back then, took over the campus, uh, took buses of students to the um, state legislature to demand more money for higher education, did the work basically of the State Board of Agriculture, which ran the uh, university at the time, by lobbying for money for the university. Uh, but my, my involvement in the movement uh, continued, and I went to law school, became a political lawyer, represented activists who were accused of uh, bombing different places uh, in front of federal grand juries. Um, I was always a creative writer, though, as a, as a kid. I wrote about my family, I wrote about my friends. Uh, when I went through college, I was writing poetry short stories. When I went to law school, that all stopped. Um, the creative juices were wrung out of me by law school. Um, for the three years in law school, I didn't do anything creative except write what I needed to write for class. Then I established myself as an attorney, went to work for legal services, the legal aid program for the state. And it was about a dozen years after that that um, I felt myself burning out. I felt myself having a midlife crisis and I went back to the creative work. Some of you might have heard this yesterday, so I, I wrote a story about a burned out Chicano attorney, <laughs> of all things. Um, that short story was published and uh, validated myself, as, validated my writing. So I continued with it. I created a series of uh, crime fiction novels using uh, the lawyer Luis Montes as my protagonist. Um, the first book, The Ballad of Rocky Ruiz, dealt with actually a lawyer who was looking back at his uh, activist days in college when a friend of his was murdered and he knew that he had to solve that mystery. Uh, and it, of course, turns out to be completely different when, from what he had uh, always suspected. But it, it was very much a story that had the movement and the politics of the Chicano students as the background. It was very much a, a story of coming of age during that political time. And then uh, what happened to a lot of the people who were involved in that activism once the marches and the demonstrations died down and there wasn't quite as much burning activity going on. So today I write what I like to call Chicano Noir. Um, or some of you may have uh, heard of hard-boiled pulp fiction, uh, that kind of stuff that uh, people read for enjoyment. And I, I prefer to think of my writing not as hard-boiled, but as huevos rancheros. You know, <laughs> we, uh... <laughs> so um, today in my books, for example, like Desperado and Mile High Noir, uh, the setting is the neighborhood where I live now, the north side of Denver. Um, the, uh, what used to be called the north side of Denver, now it's called Highlands or Lohi. Um, we have now in Denver all these fancy nicknames for neighborhoods to cover up the gentrification and the, uh, what's really happening there. Uh, people who want to live in hip neighborhoods are driving out the people who've lived there for decades. And so the culture and the atmosphere are changing dramatically. In the neighborhood where I've lived now almost 40 years, the north side, uh, the changes are dramatic. There's uh, huge condos, more expensive restaurants, and the people who have lived there for decades can't afford it, uh, are being pressured to sell their houses as quickly as possible so that they can be stripped and huge condos put up in their place. All of that is the background of Desperado, uh, even, it's crime fiction, it's a mystery, there's a murder fairly quickly uh, in the book. But the background of gentrification and the changes uh, to me provides the kind of human drama, the kind of human conflict that I want to portray in my novels. Uh, it's not a story about gentrification, but it's a story that has that as its background. Uh, and. The, the racism and the exploitation of some of the people who are living there. So now the, the next one that comes out, My Bad, is a follow-up to that. Uh, 
my protagonist is an ex-con who um, grew up and was raised in the North Side and who has to put up with the changes but really is having a hard time with that. That's the central conflict in his life um, until, of course, again, there's another murder and he has to go solve it. Thanks, Emmanuel. Your, your writing is very distinct. And um, I'm wondering, do you feel that you're doing something with race um, in your novels um, that hasn't been done um, in the noir crime genre before, quite that way? Well, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find a Latino de de detective. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it just mm. that very obvious fact exists. I think there's a lot of uh, hullabaloo now coming on because there's going to be a TV show, as I understand it, with Jimmy Smith, mm -hmm. who's going to play a private eye. Mm -hmm. And this is like, wow, why didn't we think of that before? You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there is that, that... Uh, when people think about Latino literature or Chicano literature, they don't think of mysteries. Right. And they don't think of uh, crime fiction. Mm -hmm. They don't think of me, <laughs> which uh, I'm trying to change that. But, uh, but still, it, 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 it's kind of um, uh, symbiotic, symbolic of the situation in publishing in general. Yeah. You know, um, what is often published is what's worked in the past and continues and uh, publishers are looking for authors who can repeat their successes with the same stories that have been told before. Right. And so that includes the same cast of characters mm -hmm. often, mm -hmm. the same kind of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, we go through phases where serial killers were so hot that every book that was coming out that was a bestseller was a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Then it was women detectives, uh, mm -hmm. which was fine. I mean, that was, that was a step forward at least but the plot seemed to bog down right. in what was going on with that kind of fiction. And so, uh, yeah, I think um, race and uh, ethnicity, culture, uh, are issues that are approached by my books. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at heart I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, a political writer in the sense that I'm gonna be dogmatic mm -hmm. and my ideology is gonna come out in every sentence of the characters. But for certain, what's going to come out is, I hope, a accurate reflection of the community from which I come. Right. I'd like to get back to that point, but first I'd like to hear from Amrit. I think it's on now. OK, so I grew up in London, UK. She could probably tell from my accent. I grew up in North London, um, an area called Tottenham, and as well as Edmonton. I was raised in Edmonton. Tottenham is probably known around the world as the place, the home of the football team Tottenham, but also where the London riots started in 2011. And um, so that's the place that I grew up in. It's a very Afro-Caribbean community, but it's diversified over time. And I've come from a Sikh family, um, Sikh as in S-I-K-H. Um, <laughs> um, and my parents are from Punjab, North India, and my, my grandparents had moved over from Sialkot, which is in now Pakistan, so 1947 had a huge impact on our family and the reason why we ended up in the UK. So that's the family, that di um, that's the story of my diaspora, and, and I'll, go in, I'll go into that in a bit more detail. I grew up in a, in a Punjabi family um, where I saw all my other cousins who were a lot older than me, um, you know, kind of go down the same route. Like, if you're a girl, you grow up, you learn how to cook and clean, you get an education, education was all right, um, you know, and uh, then you get married. And I remember thinking, I'm six years old, and I really remember this vivid thought that, like, that's not me. I can't imagine myself doing that. Like, there must be more to life than doing that. And I think that's that thought that I had when I was six uh, has kind of underpinned all the work that I've done since. Growing up in Tottenham, growing up um, in a place where ed the education system was quite Eurocentric, it wasn't diversified, I wasn't represented certainly in the education I was having. I didn't learn about the other side of the world. And um, 
yeah, I kind of fell fell into learning about my own own culture through my mother, who was spiritually very grounded, and that's what kept me grounded to my culture. And I think I think I um, once I got to university, I studied at the School of Oriental and African Studies, the University of London. If you haven't heard of it before, I really encourage you to either try and take a course there or go and visit it when you're in London. Um, it's a place that completely changed my life because it humanized my own culture for me. And that's why I called the company, the social enterprise that I've started, Humanized, because the issues that we're talking about today, class, race, and gender, if we humanize these issues, um, that's, that's a big deal for me, and that's what I've tried to do through my work. In terms of the youth work that I've done, is heavily influenced by my influences and experiences in Tottenham, seeing gentrification, which is happening around the world in, in major cities. It's happening in London. Um, youth culture is slowly being torn away because from central London all the way out, in North London where I live, it's kind of creeping up. And all the issues that need to be talked about are being silenced. And I guess this idea of silence, or this silence that exists in the different spheres that I work in, whether that's the silences of women when they're written in history. I studied history, I'm a historian, so unpicking and, and giving a voice to the subaltern, especially women, is um, a major uh, project of mine. But also looking at race and diversifying theater in the UK, so theater's huge in London, and slowly we're trying to diversify that and make sure there are colored people on stage, that these stories are told. Um, so I'm working on, I worked on a production on the 1947 partition of India, but more recently I've been working on the Chagossian case. Um, a really brief story about the Chagossian case is that the Chagos Islanders, which is an island literally in the middle of the Indian Ocean, um, they were evicted from their land or forcibly evicted from their land because an American air base had to be built there. And this was originally a British colony and um, they were basically pushed out of this island. Um, firstly, the, the dogs were gassed in the island to kind of show them that, hey, you really need to get out and you don't have a choice. And then slowly the people were shipped off the island and taken to the Mauritius. And even in the Mauritius, they're the lowest class um, in the class system that they have in the Mauritius. And they, they, were, they were living in poverty. And eventually they, as British citizens of the subjects of the colony, were then taken to the UK, and now there's a, h a high concentration of Chagossians li living near Gatwick Airport. So I'm working with that community through music. They're amazing musicians, they're drumming, their songs are all about the Chagos Islands and this nostalgia that exists of um, this wanting and this longing that one day they're going to go back to the island. I think today, that this year was the 50th year where they were going to hear an answer from the UN case that if they could go back, and I think they were de denied access because the land's not there anymore, it's, a, it's an, it's an airbase. And this airbase is used to, um, you know, drop bombs in Iraq, and it's a very strategically placed island where you can go anywhere from there very quickly. Um, so that's one of the projects that I'm working on. But um, yeah, I think as a, as a woman, as a young woman, as a, as a young woman, um, it's very easy for me to make an impact just by occupying a space. And I've realized the power in doing that more recently than ever, even as a global youth ambassador, just being in a space or being on a stage where people aren't used to seeing you or speaking about your experience. Um, I realize that just being in a space can inspire people and other young girls to just come out and, and know that their story is valid and know that their voices should be heard. Um, I think I'm gonna perform a song now. Okay. Um, should I do it now or do you want me to do it? Yeah, well, actually, uh, um, one thing I'd like to ask first, listening yeah, sure. to you speak and thinking about gender, yeah. um, what are the particular challenges for you as a woman performer in today's um, landscape of arts and culture? What, what are the challenges for women performers? So if I take the Indian classical angle first on that question, so as an Indian classical musician, there aren't many um, women playing the sarangi, which is the instrument I play. Mm. Um, it's a very male-dominated sphere of the arts, um, a lot of male teachers, 
and um, you know all the doubler players and the percussionists will be male. So you're you're in a very male environment. Mm. Um, so for me, I'm still negotiating that. I'm still trying to understand. Um, okay, when is it? As a performer, can I feel empowered? Because in within the Indian classical system, there is this almost etiquette to completely lower yourself. Mm. Um, and I completely understand that in this idea of being humble. Mm. But as a woman, when you're already lower, um, then humbling yourself even more. I've been in very uncomfortable situations where I was like, this is, as a performer, I, I want, when I'm on stage, I want to own that stage. I want to be able to be confident and be empowered. But then right up against that, I'm hearing, oh, she's become really arrogant, or she thinks she knows what she's doing, and she can... And yeah, I've definitely had moments where I've completely doubted myself and questioned whether you know I'm doing the right thing. But I always come back to why I started this started this in the first place, and it's about the art, and that comes first. And for me, growing up, all I wanted was a voice um, to, to talk about the experiences of growing up in London, to talk about experiences of young women growing up in the South Asian diaspora in London. So it's, it's definitely something that I'm still trying to negotiate right. and trying to understand when is something, you know, this idea of just being humble. For me, I don't even want to think about being humble as long as I feel empowered and I'm being true to myself. Yeah. I can live, with, live in peace with myself. Right. But um, yeah, I think it's something that all women performers are still negotiating as right. a performer, but even as a director of theatre, right. to being able to know that you're creative and you have creative ideas and ideas of your own projects and music mm -hmm. um, it's something that you learn through experience and just yeah. gaining confidence in how to communicate with different people right. without making them feel uncomfortable I don't think the idea is to make someone feel like yeah. hey you're discriminating against me right. for me it's more like um, you know if we have um, arrogance up here and we have submissive here there's this whole space in the middle which you can call assertive so you can be assertive without being rude or being arrogant and that's something I'm still trying to learn how to do, so. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I'd love to hear you perform, if you give us a little snippet of something. Yeah, so what I'm gonna perform is uh, a poem written by Amrita Pritham, who was uh, a very strong woman writing in the 1950s, and she is classed as a writer under the Progressive Writers Movement. Um, so Amrita Pritham writes about the 1947 partition of India and she describes, so everyone you know, was talking about partition in the 50s and 60s, and it was a very recent event, very politicized narrative that was coming out of the two countries that were now extremely nationalist. So she kind of humanizes, again, I'm coming back to this idea of humanize because I just feel like that's just the way to really understand history. And she humanizes the partition in a way that very few writers at the time were able to do. And she was, in particular, able to give women a voice in, in the partition narrative. Uh, so she talks about the rapes, the sexual violence, the, the riots, the fact that women had become territory in this partition and, and the communal violence that was going on, no matter what side of partition, the partition line they were on. So in this poem, she calls out to a, a poet that wrote an epic on one woman. And he says, and she says to him, Vardis Shah, who was the, the poet, she says, Vardisha, you need to speak from your grave. You wrote an epic for one woman, and now there are thousands of women dying. You need to give them a voice, and you need to open that book up again and write more poetry for them. So this is the kind of the first line of the poem. And um, even when it's recited, it's quite powerful in itself. But So the way that I've composed it, I tried to do justice to that. And this is a, it's a composition that I did for the play that I was the music director for On Partition, in which we incorporated oral histories as opposed to just a fiction um, story. And so, yeah, it, uh, and she also describes in the poem the, quite graphically what Punjab looked like in 1947 with rivers of blood flowing and, and um, really bloody graves and uh, the, a love that was lost and people have forgotten how to be romantic and play the flute. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to give you a gist of the context so when you actually hear it, you have something to, some reference point. But I hope that the way that I've composed it kind of transcends the barriers of language. So I'm just going to set up quickly okay. and then maybe you can talk on there. Okay, <laughs> yes. Well, actually, um, while Amrit is setting up, I'd like to hear from Michael since we're on the issue of gender. Can you 
maybe speak some more about how gen how you see gender as intersecting um, with your with your memoir and yeah, your, so yeah. th when I, when I first started writing all souls um, I, I, from the outset I knew that I I had a story to tell that was going to counter the narrative about who these moms were right. in our communities, mm -hmm. um, whose children were dying, because they're always the ones to blame. Mm -hmm. They're usually the only one. They're they're usually the one to blame because they're the they're the only one there. Right. <laughs> so, right. um, and in the whole kind of narrative at the time of the, and you know, it's still around, but um, especially in the '90s around the. Um, the kind of welfare queen and all that. So from the from the get go, I knew that my mother's role in this story was huge, mm -hmm. as were the stories of these women from other neighborhoods um, mm -hmm. who had become my surrogate moms as well. My mother's still alive, um, but but I have many moms, <laughs> and um, but the you know it became more and more obvious throughout the writing of the book. Um, the role of gender, the fact that we're talking about a neighborhood that, like I said, 75% single parent female headed households, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to nearby uh, poor black and Latino neighborhoods, which also had about the same percentages of right. single parent female headed households. And, um, and the other thing I learned as I was writing it is that when I was, you know, I started to realize that so many of the women in our neighborhood mm -hmm. were like my mother in that they were women who had left um, beatings. Mm. And a lot of them were some of the first um, of their families to leave rather than stay, because you're supposed to, especially, you know, my mother growing up in an Irish Catholic family, um, fractured skull, broken ribs from her husband. She went to the local priest because that's who you went to, um, not to the police and not to a therapist or anything like that, but um, she went to the local priest and he said, you're a Catholic, make the best of it. And that's just, you know, that's just horrific that that's uh, what women have lived with and still live with to this day in many um, situations. So I was very aware of that throughout the whole thing and, and started to also realize that so many of these neighborhoods are made up of women who had left and therefore became the bad girls of the family because they divorced, especially in, in a lot of uh, religious families, whether Catholic or other religious families. So and then became outcasted, I started to realize writing it that you didn't see too many aunts and uncles and cousins. And I'm like, who were these? I, I, I knew that you didn't see, like our, our extended family wouldn't really tread through projects either. And they were just barely working class, but they wouldn't go to the projects. But so many of the other families, you didn't see the extended family support that's so important um, to families. Thanks for sharing that. Are you ready for us, Amrit?
Thank you, Amrit. Um, I think that we are almost out of uh, time, and it's time for the audience questions. Okay, right. Okay, I have one more question I'd like for our panelists to just address quickly, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. And I want to close by, um, I'm thinking about the African-American poet Audre Lorde, and she said that poetry is not a luxury. And all of you, I feel, are activists, um, you know, through your work, in, in, in your own ways, various ways. And I'm wondering, um, can you maybe just very quickly, each of you, um, say, um, I'm wondering, to what extent do you feel that we as artists um, have um, some sort of, um, I don't want to say obligation, but maybe duty to our communities um, to somehow bring about, bring about social change? Do you feel that it... I can yeah. Quickly, um, just initially when I became, started doing community organizing work long before I wrote All Souls, I, I was doing all work in the community and, and it was just an urgent thing and I felt really, you know, obligated. It was life or death and it was about kind of redeeming all this stuff that had happened in my family and, mm -hmm. and working with other, making those connections with other families across town. And, and it was really all about voice. I think, you know, you, you said that today, today that you just wanted a voice and that's what I wanted. And then I turned it to writing, and then one of the things I was happy to be able to do once I started writing is to just tell a story. Right. So to no longer speak, you know, like an activist, and to tell it. When I when I teach students writing, I, you know, there's there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff these days that's coming out that's much more tell than show, and I think that the show is a lot more powerful if we help people to walk right. in our shoes and to empathize. That's right. it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah, that that's a can be problematic, uh, especially for a fiction writer. But mm -hmm. I, the, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, I'm a storyteller, and uh, as a fiction writer, as a writer, I have to be selfish. Mm -hmm. I have to think about the art that I want to create, yeah. and I have to do the things to, to get that out there mm -hmm. in the way, the voice that I want to create, mm -hmm. not somebody else's, not something that's imposed on me, mm -hmm. but. On the other other hand, the um, I have to be true to the community that I know, yeah, and, and true to my history, mm -hmm. to uh, my own sense of uh, relevancy, and so the stories are going to come out that I think need to be told. That, that I have to feel I'm the only one who can tell this story, and with that obligation, then comes telling the whole story, the truthful part of the story. So it, it can become political at that level. But it, I never try to set out to say, I'm going to write a story today mm -hmm. so that the masses will get aroused. But right. I'm going to write a story that is true to, right. to the reality I know. Right. And if it's true, then it will have, it, he will have that power. Thank you. Emirates? Yeah, I think for me, the need came before the art. Hmm. So I identified a need that I wanted to be able to express myself. And the social change was within myself first and being able to uh, empower myself. And now I, I guess I'm the role model I never had. Mm -hmm. And I always use this phrase um, with my company is that I feel empowered to empower. So what I'm doing now is that the change that I felt and what I did to empower myself, I'm now just empowering other people to be able to create that change within themselves. Right. So I guess that it's inherent, the social change is inherent in the work. True. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. And are there questions from our audience? When um, Michael was relating his story that happened many, many years ago, I couldn't help but think about the parallels of what's happening now with young African-American, um, mostly males. And one of the main reasons I was always taught to study history was so that we don't 
make the same, you know, horrible mistakes over and over, and it seems like it's just kind of ongoing. And I, when you talk about the mothers, I think about the mothers now that are, when they send their teenage boy out, maybe they're going to get shot, you know, because of who they are, how they look. And, that's, and I'd say, I have to say that that's a, you know, anti, anti-black racism in this country is a very specific thing. Um, and I wouldn't conflate one for the other, but it's all related. And, and, um, and of course, poor white people in this country have played a role in, in all of this in terms of um, and in terms of being, as Michelle Alexander says, collateral damage in a lot of cases. But, you know, in terms of numbers, most poor people are white. Of course, most Americans are, you know, it's the largest uh, group. But, but there's 26 million human beings who are uh, white and poor uh, live in, in poverty. But the, it's just quieter and you don't hear about it as much. Um, but that said, I, I, my, my dream is for that population to step up to the plate and to and to be involved in things like Black Lives Matter because you know it's 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 all um, it's intertwined all the race and class and gender stuff it's so intertwined and they're not to be one can't be conflated for the other but they're they're so related and they're you know and and we we all kind of um, need to cross these bridges I think in terms of our solidarity. There are other questions, someone over here? Okay. Um, yeah, I found uh, each one of you very fascinating. Uh, but the challenge that I think people face today is writers are only as good as their readers. And so there is um, uh, the problem of you remaining in little enclaves, writing for yourself, for few interested communities, and so forth. But the challenge in today's world is that challenge of talking with each other and alongside each other. And I'm reminded of a beautiful um, book that is written, written in South Africa, I come from South Africa, where Amy Beale, you probably are familiar with, an American girl was killed in a, a township. And uh, a, a black writer writes this book called Mother to Mother. And she writes to Amy Beale's mother to say, did I raise this child? And did I tell him, hey boy boy, get up today, find a white girl and kill her? And she tells this most emotive story of how this child was raised in a degenerative kind of an environment and how that environment created the killer and not the mother. So I found it very useful. I think mothers need to talk to each other. Thank you. Do we have time for another one? No, one more. One more. Anyone? Else? Race, class, gender are all ways of dividing people. And do you think race, class, and gender has, have anything to do with uh, capitalism? I'll just say everything, yes. And I'd say racism, not because racism, I mean, racism is an invention, of course, but it's racism that's a problem. It's, and not classism so much as poverty. And it's not. Uh, gender, but misogyny, you know what I mean? So I think we kind of phrase it wrong. And it's all tied in, I believe, very much so with um, capitalism. Well, well certainly it's tied in. Uh, and, uh, and I think you know, we could trace the economic roots of racism and um, discrimination in this country. And we would come to the, the conclusion that uh, they're so intertwined that sometimes it's hard to see how they're separate. But on the other hand, I think we, we need to be uh, aware that racism is a worldwide problem and that it doesn't just exist only in capitalist countries and that uh, it, it's something that has to be fought at a global level. And so the, the ideology may be there in some countries that, that 
that give face value to anti-racist uh, programs, but still, if we dig deeper, we're going to still find it. And so, uh, the key there is, you know, why does that happen? Uh, is it more a, a trait of human nature itself, or is it do we do we always blame the economics, or do we blame something else? Um, yeah, I think from my uh, experience, I think history shows us that it's got everything to do with capitalism, but more so power. Um, power is the root of capitalism, if you will. And yeah, I think that's my answer, that it's got everything to do with power. And that counteracts with the idea that it, these things don't only exist in um, capitalist countries, they, exi it, they exist in other countries too. But yeah, it's the power that we're dealing with here and where the power lies. And Amrit and I talked yesterday for about an hour about the, the kind of uh, the roots in colonialism um, and coming from an Irish background too, um, the Irish being you know, the only white European group who were colonized rather than colonizer. Um, all of the issues in Ireland and in Irish America, I, I believe, are rooted in that. But colonialism and capitalism, I mean, you know, they're one's an outgrowth of the other. And I think in countries where, you know, I mean, globally, I think, Colonialism taught racism to countries that might not have otherwise discovered this notion of race. It's the colonizer that taught us this. It's the great empires, Britain and Spain and so forth. Right. Well, thank you. Thanks to each of you for your wisdom.